The Body Snatcher by Robert Louis Stevenson Every night in the year, four of us sat in the small parlour of the George at Debenham, the undertaker and the landlord and Fettis and myself. Sometimes there would be more, but blow high, blow low, come rain or snow or frost, we four would be each planted in his own particular armchair. Fettis was an old drunken Scotsman, a man of education, obviously, and a man of some property since he lived in idleness. He had come to Debenham years ago while still young, and by a mere continuance of living had grown to be an adopted townman. His blue camlet cloak was a local antiquity like the church spire. He drank rum, five glasses regularly every evening, and for the greater portion of his nightly visit to the George, sat, with his glass in his right hand, in a state of melancholy alcoholic saturation. We called him the doctor, for he was supposed to have some special knowledge of medicine, and had been known, upon a pinch, to set a fracture or reduce a dislocation. But beyond these slight particulars, we had no knowledge of his character and antecedents. One dark winter night, it had struck nine some time before the landlord joined us, there was a sick man in the George. A great neighbouring proprietor suddenly struck down with apoplexy on his way to Parliament. And the great man's still greater London doctor had been telegraphed to his bedside. It was the first time that such a thing had happened in Debenham, for the railway was but newly open, and we were all proportionately moved by the occurrence. He's come, said the landlord after he had filled and lighted his pipe. He, said I, who? Not the doctor. Himself, replied our host. What's his name? Dr. McFarlane, said the landlord. Fetis was far through his third tumbler, stupidly fuddled, now nodding over, now staring mazily around him. But at the last word he seemed to awaken and repeated the name... McFarlane, twice, quietly enough the first time, but with sudden emotion at the second. Yes, said the landlord, that's his name, Dr. Wolf McFarlane. Fettis became instantly sober. His eyes awoke, his voice became clear, loud and steady, his language forcible and earnest. We were all startled by the transformation, as if a man had risen from the dead. I beg your pardon, he said. I'm afraid I've not been paying much attention to your talk. Who is this Wolf McFarlane? And then when he'd heard the landlord out, it cannot be, it cannot be, he added. And yet I would like well to see him face to face. Do you know him, doctor? asked the undertaker with a gasp. God forbid! was the reply, and yet the name is a strange one. It were too much to fancy, too. Tell me, landlord, is he old? Well, said the host, he's not a young man, to be sure, and his hair is white, but he looks younger than you. He's older, though, years older. But, with a slap upon the table, it's the rum you see in my face, rum and sin. This man, perhaps, may have an easy conscience and a good digestion. Conscience. Hear me speak. You would think I was some good, old, decent Christian, would you not? But no, not I. I never canted. Voltaire might have canted if he'd stood in my shoes, but the brains with a rattling fillip on his bald head. The brains were clear and active, and I saw and made no deductions. If you know this, Doctor, I ventured to remark after a somewhat awful pause, I should gather that you do not share the landlord's good opinion. Fettis paid no regard to me. Yes, he said with sudden decision, I must see him face to face. There was another pause, and then a door was closed rather sharply on the first floor, and a step was heard upon the stair. That's the doctor, 
cried the landlord. Look sharp, and you can catch him. It was but two steps from the small parlour to the door of the old George Inn. Fettis walked steadily to the spot. We, who were hanging behind, beheld the two men meet, as one of them had phrased it, face to face. Dr. McFarlane was alert and vigorous. His white hair set off his pale and placid, although energetic, countenance. He was richly dressed in the finest of broadcloth and the whitest of linen, with a great gold watch-chain and studs and spectacles of the same precious material. He wore a broad folded tie, white and speckled with lilac, and he carried on his arm a comfortable driving coat of fur. There was no doubt, but he became his years, breathing as he did of wealth and consideration. And it was a surprising contrast to see our parlour sot, bald, dirty, pimpled, and robed in his old camlet cloak, confront him at the bottom of the stairs. Macfarlane, he said somewhat loudly, more like a herald than a friend. The great doctor pulled up short on the fourth step, as though the familiarity of the address surprised and somewhat shocked his dignity. Toddy Macfarlane, repeated Fettis. The London man almost staggered. He stared swiftest of seconds at the man before him, glanced behind him with a sort of scare, and then in a startled whisper, Fettis, he said, you? I, said the other, me. Did you think I was dead too? We're well, not so easy shut of our acquaintance. Hush, hush, exclaimed the doctor. Hush, hush. This meeting is so unexpected. I can see you are unmanned. I hardly knew you, I confess, at first, but I am overjoyed, overjoyed to have this opportunity. For the present it must be how to do and goodbye in one, for my fly is waiting and I must not fail the train. But you shall, let me see, yes, yes, you shall give me your address and you can count on early news of me. We must do something for you, Fettis. I fear you are out at elbows, but we must see to that for old Lang Syne, as once we sang at suppers. Money, cried Fettis. Money from you? The money that I had from you is lying where I cast it in the rain. Dr. Macfarlane had talked himself into some measure of superiority and confidence, but the uncommon energy of this refusal cast him back into his first confusion. A horrible, ugly look came and went across his almost venerable countenance. My dear fellow, he said, be it as you please, my last thought is to offend you. I would intrude on none. I will leave you my address, however. I do not wish it. I do not wish to know the roof that shelters you, interrupted the other. I heard your name. I feared it might be you. I wish to know if, after all, there were a god. I know now that there is none. Be gone. He still stood in the middle of the rug between the stair and the doorway, and the great London physician, in order to escape, would be forced to step to one side. It was plain that he hesitated before the thought of this humiliation. White as he was, there was a dangerous glitter in his spectacles. But while he still paused, uncertain, he became aware that the driver of his fly was peering in from the street at this unusual scene, and caught a glimpse at the same time of our little body from the parlour huddled by the corner of the bar. The presence of so many witnesses decided him at once to flee. But his tribulation was not yet entirely at an end, for even as he was passing, Fetis clutched him by the arm, and these words came in a whisper, and yet painfully distinct. Have you seen it again? The great rich London doctor cried out aloud with a sharp, throttling cry. He dashed his questioner across the open space, and with his hands over his head, fled out of the door like a detected thief. Before it had occurred to one of us to make a movement, the fly was already rattling towards the station. The scene was over like a dream, but the dream had left proofs and traces of its passage. Next day, a servant found the fine gold spectacles broken on the threshold, and that very night we were all standing breathless by the barroom window, and Fetis at our side, sober, pale, and resolute in look. God protect us, Mr. Fettis, said the landlord, coming first into possession of his customary senses. What in the universe is all this? 
These are strange things you've been saying. Pettis turned towards us. He looked us each in succession in the face. See if you can hold your tongues, said he. That man, Macfarlane, is not safe to cross. Those that have done so already have repented it too late. And then, without so much as finishing his third glass, far less waiting for the other two, he bade us goodbye and went forth under the lamp of the hotel into the black night. We three turned to our places in the parlour with the big red fire and four clear candles. And as we recapitulated what had passed, the first chill of our surprise soon changed into a glow of curiosity. We sat late. It was the latest session I have known in the old George. It was no great boast, but I believe I was a better hand at worming out a story than either of my fellows at the George. And perhaps there is now no other man alive who could narrate to you the following foul and unnatural events. In his young days, Fettis studied medicine in the schools of Edinburgh. He had talent of a kind, a talent that picks up swiftly what it hears and readily retails it for its own. He worked little at home, but he was civil, attentive and intelligent in the presence of his masters. They soon picked him out as a lad who listened closely and remembered well. Nay, strange it seemed to me when I first heard it. He was in those days well favoured and pleased by his exterior. There was at that period a certain extramural teacher of anatomy whom I shall here designate by the letter K. His name was subsequently too well known. The man who bore it skulked through the streets of Edinburgh in disguise, while the mob that applauded at the execution of Burke called loudly for the blood of his employer. But Mr. K. was then at the top of his vogue. He enjoyed a popularity due partly to his own talent and address, partly to the incapacity of his rival, the university professor. Mr. K. was a bon vivant as well as an accomplished teacher. He liked a sly allusion no less than a careful preparation. In both capacities, Fetis enjoyed and deserved his notice, and by the second year of his attendance, he held the half-regular position of second demonstrator or sub-assistant in his class. In this capacity, the charge of the theatre and lecture room devolved in particular upon his shoulders. He had to answer for the cleanliness of the premises and the conduct of the other students, and it was a part of his duty to supply, receive and divide the various subjects. It was with a view to this last at that time very delicate affair, that he was lodged by Mr. K. in the same wind, and at last in the same building, with the dissecting rooms. Here, after a night of turbulent pleasures, his hand still tottering, his sight still misty and confused, he would be called out of bed in the black hours before the winter dawn by the unclean and desperate interlopers who supplied the table. He would open the door to these men, since infamous throughout the land. He would help them with their tragic burthen, pay them their sordid price, and remain alone when they were gone with the unfriendly relics of humanity. From such a scene he would return to snatch another hour or two of slumber, to repair the abuses of the night, and refresh himself for the labours of the day. Thus. He made it his pleasure to gain some distinction in his studies, and day after day rendered unimpeachable eye service to his employer, Mr. K. For his day of work, he indemnified himself by nights of roaring, blackguardly enjoyment. And when that balance had been struck, the organ that he called his conscience declared itself content. The supply of subjects was a continual trouble to him as well as to his master. In that large and busy class, the raw material of the anatomists kept perpetually running out, and the business thus rendered necessary was not only unpleasant in itself, but threatened dangerous consequences to all who were concerned. It was the policy of Mr. K. to ask no questions in his dealings with the trade. 
They bring the body, and we pay the price, he used to say. There was no understanding that the subjects were provided by the crime of murder. Had that idea been broached to him in words, he would have recoiled in horror. But the lightness of his speech upon so grave a matter was in itself an offence against good manners and a temptation to the men with whom he dealt. Fetis, for instance, had often remarked to himself upon the singular freshness of the bodies. He had been struck again and again by the hang-dog abominable looks of the ruffians who came to him before the dawn. One November morning, his policy of silence was put sharply to the test. He'd been awake all night with a racking toothache, pacing his room like a caged beast or throwing himself in fury on his bed, and had fallen at last into that profound, uneasy slumber that so often follows on a night of pain, when he was awakened by the third or fourth angry repetition of the concerted signal. There was a thin, bright moonshine. It was bitter cold, windy and frosty. The town had not yet awakened, but an indefinable stir already preluded the noise and business of the day. The ghouls had come later than usual, and they seemed more than usually eager to be gone. Fetis, sick with sleep, lighted them upstairs. As he did so, his eyes lighted on the dead face. He started. He took two steps nearer with the candle raised. God Almighty! he cried. That is Jane Galbraith! The men answered nothing, but they shuffled nearer the door. I know her, I tell you, he continued. She was alive and hearty yesterday. It's impossible she can be dead. It's impossible you could have got this body fairly. So, sir, you're mistaken entirely, asserted one of the men. But the other looked Fetis darkly in the eyes and demanded the money on the spot. It was impossible to misconceive the threat or to exaggerate the danger. The lad's heart failed him. He staggered some excuses, counted out the sum, and saw his hateful visitors depart. No sooner were they gone than he hastened to confirm his doubts. By a dozen unquestionable marks, he identified the girl he had jested with the day before. He saw, with horror, marks upon her body that might well betoken violence. A panic seized him, and he took refuge in his room. There he reflected at length over the discovery that he had made, considered soberly the bearing of Mr. K.'s instructions, and the danger to himself of interference in so serious a business, and at last, in sore perplexity, determined to wait for the advice of his immediate superior, the class assistant. This was a young doctor, Wolf Macfarlane, a high favourite among all the restless students, clever, dissipated, and unscrupulous to the last degree. He had travelled and studied abroad. His manners were agreeable and a little forward. He was an authority on the stage, skilful on the ice or the links, with skate or golf club. He dressed with nice audacity, and to put the finishing touch upon his glory, he kept a gig and a strong trotting horse. On that particular morning, Macfarlane arrived somewhat earlier than his wont. Fetis heard him and met him on the stairs, told him his story, and showed him the cause of his alarm. Macfarlane examined the marks on her body. Yes, he said with a nod. It looks fishy. Well, what should I do? asked Fetis. Do? repeated the other. Do you want to do anything? Least said, soonest mended, I should say. Someone else might recognize her, objected Fetis. She was as well known as the Castle Rock. We'll hope not, said Macfarlane. And if anybody does, well, you didn't, don't you see? And there's an end. The fact is, this has been going on too long. Stir up the mud and you'll get Kay into the most unholy trouble. You'll be in a shocking box yourself. So will I, if you come to that. I should like to know how any one of us would look, or what the devil we should have to say for ourselves in any Christian witness box. For me, you know, there's one thing certain, that, practically speaking, all our subjects have been murdered. Macfarlane, cried Fetis. 
Come now, sneered the other, as if you hadn't suspected it yourself. Suspecting is one thing and proof another. Yes, I know. And I'm as sorry as you are this should have come here, tapping the body with his cane. The next best thing for me is not to recognize it. And he added coolly, I don't. You may, if you please. I don't dictate, but I think a man of the world would do as I do. And I may add, I fancy that is what K would look for at our hands. The question is, why did he choose us two for his assistance? And I answer, because he didn't want old wives. This was the tone of all others to affect the mind of a lad like Fettis. He agreed to imitate Macfarlane. The body of the unfortunate girl was duly dissected, and no one remarked or appeared to recognize her. One afternoon when his day's work was over, Fettis dropped into a popular tavern and found Macfarlane sitting with a stranger. This was a small man, very pale and dark, with coal-black eyes. The cut of his features gave a promise of intellect and refinement, which was but feebly realized in his manners, for he proved upon a nearer acquaintance, coarse, vulgar, and stupid. He exercised, however, a very remarkable control over Macfarlane. This most offensive person took a fancy to Fetis on the spot, plied him with drinks, and honored him with unusual confidences on his past career. If a tenth part of what he confessed were true, he was a very loathsome rogue, and the lad's vanity was tickled by the attention of so experienced a man. I'm a pretty bad fellow myself, the stranger remarked, but Macfarlane is the boy. Toddy Macfarlane, I call him. Toddy, order your friend another glass. Or it might be, Toddy, you jump up and shut the door. Toddy hates me, he said again. Oh, yes, Toddy, you do. Don't call me that confounded name, growled Macfarlane. Yeah, him. Did you ever see the lad's plain knife? He would like to do that all over my body, remarked the stranger. We medicals have a better way than that, said Fettis. When we dislike a dead friend of ours, we dissect him. Macfarlane looked up sharply as though this jest was scarcely to his mind. The afternoon passed. Grey, for that was the stranger's name, invited Fetis to join them at dinner, ordered a feast so sumptuous that the tavern was thrown in commotion, and when all was done, commanded Macfarlane to settle the bill. It was late before they separated. The man, Grey, was incapably drunk. Macfarlane, sobered by his fury, chewed the cud of the money he had been forced to squander and the slights he had been obliged to swallow. Fetis, with various liquors singing in his head, returned home with devious footsteps and a mind entirely in abeyance. Next day, Macfarlane was absent from the class, and Fetis smiled to himself as he imagined him still squiring the intolerable grey from tavern to tavern. As soon as the hour of liberty had struck, he posted from place to place in quest of his last night's companions. He could find them, however, nowhere so returned early to his rooms, went early to bed, and slept the sleep of the just. At four in the morning he was awakened by the well-known signal. Descending to the door, he was filled with astonishment to find Macfarlane with his gig, and in the gig one of those long and ghastly packages with which he was so well acquainted. What? he cried. Have you been out alone? How did you manage? But Macfarlane silenced him roughly, bidding him turn to business. When they had got the body upstairs and laid it on the table, Macfarlane made it first as if he were going away. Then he paused and seemed to hesitate, and then... You had better look at the face, said he, in terms of some constraint. You had better, he repeated as Fetis only stared at him in wonder. But where and how and when did you come by it? cried the other. Look at the face was the only answer. Fetis 
was staggered. Strange doubts assailed him. He looked from the young doctor to the body and then back again. At last, with a start, he did as he was bidden. He had almost expected the sight that met his eyes, and yet the shock was cruel. To see, fixed in the rigidity of death and naked on that coarse layer of sackcloth, the man whom he had left well clad and full of meat and sin upon the threshold of a tavern, awoke, even in the thoughtless fetus, some of the terrors of the conscience. His first concern regarded Wolf. Unprepared for a challenge so momentous, he knew not how to look his comrade in the face. He durst not meet his eye, and he had neither words nor voice at his command. It was Macfarlane himself who made the first advance. He came up quietly behind and laid his hand gently but firmly on the other's shoulder. Richardson, said he, may have the head. Now, Richardson was a student who had long been anxious for that portion of the human subject to dissect. There was no answer, and the murderer resumed. Talking of business, you must pay me. Your accounts, you see, must tally. Fettis found a voice, the ghost of his own. Pay you, he cried. Pay you for that? Well, yes, of course you must. By all means, and on every possible account, you must, returned the other. I dare not give it for nothing. You dare not take it for nothing. It would compromise us both. This is another case like Jane Galbraith's. The more things are wrong, the more we must act as if all were right. Where does old Kay keep his money? There, answered Fettis hoarsely, pointing to a cupboard in the corner. Give me the key, then, said the other calmly, holding out his hand. There was an instant's hesitation, and the die was cast. Macfarlane could not suppress a nervous twitch, the infinitesimal mark of an immense relief as he felt the key turn between his fingers. He opened the cupboard, brought out pen and ink and a paper book that stood in one compartment, and separated from the funds in a drawer a sum suitable to the occasion. Now look here, he said. There is the payment made. First proof of your good faith. First step to your security. You have now to clinch it by a second. Enter the payment in your book, and then you, for your part, may defy the devil. The next few seconds were for Fetis, an agony of thought, but in balancing his terrors it was the most immediate that triumphed. Any future difficulty seemed almost welcome if he could avoid a present quarrel with Macfarlane. He set down the candle which he had been carrying all the time, and with a steady hand entered the date, the nature and the amount of the transaction. And now, said Macfarlane, it's only fair that you should pocket the lucre. I've had my share already. By the by, when a man of the world falls into a bit of luck, he has a few shillings extra in his pocket. I'm ashamed to speak of it, but there's a rule of conduct in the case. No treating, no purchase of expensive class books, no squaring of old debts. Borrow, don't lend. Macfarlane, began Fettis, still somewhat hoarsely, I have put my neck in a halter to oblige you. To oblige me, cried Wolf. Oh, come, you did as near as I can see the matter, what you downright had to do in self-defence. Suppose I got into trouble, where would you be? This second little matter flows clearly from the first. Mr. Gray is the continuation of Miss Galbraith. You can't begin and then stop. If you begin, you must keep on beginning. That's the truth. No rest for the wicked. My God, he cried, but what have I done? And when did I begin to be made a class assistant in the name of reason? Where's the harm in that? Service wanted the position. Service might have got it. Would he have been where I am now? My dear fellow, said Macfarlane, what a boy you are. What harm has come to you? What harm can come to you if you hold it tongue? Why, man, do you know what this life is? There are two squads of us, the lions and the lambs. If you're a lamb, you'll come to lie upon these tables like Grey or Jane Galbraith. If you're a lion, you'll live and drive a horse like me, like Kay, like all the world with any wit or courage. You're staggered at the first. But look at Kay. My dear fellow, you're clever. You have pluck. I like you. 
and K likes you. You were born to lead the hunt. And I tell you on my honour and my experience of life, three days from now you'll laugh at all these scarecrows like a high school boy at a pass. And with that, McFarlane took his departure and drove off up the wind in his gig to get under cover before daylight. Hours passed. The class began to arrive. The members of the unhappy Grey were dealt out to one and to another and received without remark. Richardson was made happy with the head, and before the hour of freedom rang, Fettis trembled with exultation to perceive how far they had already gone towards safety. For two days he continued to watch, with increasing joy, the dreadful process of disguise. On the third day, Macfarlane made his appearance. He'd been ill, he said, but he made up for lost time by the energy with which he directed the students. To Richardson in particular, he extended the most valuable assistance and advice, and that student, encouraged by the praise of the demonstrator, burned high with ambitious hopes and saw the medal already in his grasp. Before the week was out, Macfarlane's prophecy had been fulfilled. Fetis had outlived his terrors and had forgotten his baseness. He began to plume himself upon his courage and had so arranged the story in his mind that he could look back on these events with an unhealthy pride. Of his accomplice he saw but little. They met, of course, in the business of the class. They received their orders together from Mr. K. At times they had a word or two in private, and Macfarlane was from first to last particularly kind and jovial. But it was plain that he avoided any reference to their common secret. And even when Fetis whispered to him that he had cast in his lot with the lions and forsworn the lambs, he only signed to him smilingly to hold his peace. At length, an occasion arose which drew the pair once more into a closer union. Mr. K was again short of subjects. Pupils were eager and it was a part of this teacher's pretensions to be always well supplied. At the same time there came the news of a burial in the rustic graveyard of Glen Course. Time has little changed the place in question. It stood then, as now, upon the crossroad, out of call of human habitations, and buried fathom deep in the foliage of six cedar trees. Two bodies that had been laid in earth, in joyful expectation of a far different awakening, there came that hasty, lamp-lit, terror-haunted resurrection of the spade and mattock. The coffin was forced, the sediments torn, and the melancholy relics clad in sackcloth, after being rattled for hours on moonless byways, were at length exposed to uttermost indignities for a class of gaping boys. Somewhat as two vultures may swoop upon a dying lamb, Fetis and Macfarlane were to be let loose upon a grave in that green and quiet resting place. The wife of a farmer, a woman who had lived for sixty years and been known for nothing but good butter and a godly conversation, was to be rooted from her grave at midnight and carried dead and naked to that faraway city that she had always honoured with her Sunday best. The place beside her family was to be empty till the crack of doom, her innocent and almost venerable members to be exposed to that last curiosity of the anatomist. Late one afternoon the pair set forth, well wrapped in cloaks and furnished with a formidable bottle. It rained without remission, a cold, dense, lashing rain. Now and again there blew a puff of wind, but these sheets of falling water kept it down. Bottle and all, it was a sad and silent drive as far as Pennycook, where they were to spend the evening. They stopped once to hide their implements in a thick bush not far from the churchyard, and once again at the fisher's tryst to have a toast before the kitchen fire and vary their nips of whisky with a glass of ale. When they reached their journey's end, the gig was housed, the horse was fed and comforted, and the two young doctors in a private room sat down to the best dinner and the best wine the house afforded. 
The lights, the fire, the beating rain upon the window, the cold, incongruous work that lay before them, added zest to their enjoyment of the meal. With every glass, their cordiality increased. Soon, Macfarlane handed a little pile of gold to his companion. Fettis pocketed the money and applauded the sentiment to the echo. You are a philosopher, he cried. I was an ass till I knew you. You and Kay between you by the Lord Harry, but you'll make a man of me. Of course we shall, applauded Macfarlane. A man? I tell you, it required a man to back me up the other morning. There are some big, brawling, forty-year-old cowards who would have turned sick at the look of the damned thing, but not you. You kept your head. I watched you. Well, and why not? Fettis thus vaunted himself. It was no affair of mine. There was nothing to gain on the one side but disturbance, and on the other I could count on your gratitude, don't you see? And he slapped his pocket till the gold pieces rang. Macfarlane somehow felt a certain touch of alarm at these unpleasant words. He may have regretted that he had taught his young companion so successfully, but he had no time to interfere, for the other noisily continued in this boastful strain. The great thing is not to be afraid. Now, between you and me, I don't want to hang, that's practical, but for all can't, Macfarlane, I was born with a contempt. Hell, God, devil, right, wrong, sin, crime, and all the old gallery of curiosities. They may frighten boys, but men of the world, like you and me, despise them. Here's to the memory of Grey. It was by this time growing somewhat late. The gig, according to order, was brought round to the door with both lamps brightly shining, and the young men had to pay their bill and take the road. They announced that they were bound for Peebles, and drove in that direction till they were clear of the last houses of the town, then, extinguishing the lamps, returned upon their course and followed a by-road towards Glen Course. Thus, under the dripping trees, and environed by huge and moving shadows, they reached the scene of their unhallowed labours. They were both experienced in such affairs, and powerful with the spade and they had scarce been twenty minutes at their task before they were rewarded by a dull rattle on the coffin lid. At the same moment, Macfarlane, having hurt his hand upon a stone, flung it carelessly above his head. The grave in which they now stood almost to the shoulders was close to the edge of the plateau of the graveyard, and the gig lamp had been propped the better to illuminate their labours against a tree and on the immediate verge of the steep bank descending to the stream. Chance had taken a sure aim with the stone. Then came a clang of broken glass. Night fell upon them. Sounds alternately dull and ringing announced the bounding of the lantern down the bank and its occasional collision with the trees. They were so nearly at an end of their abhorred task that they judged it wisest to complete it in the dark. The coffin was exhumed and broken open the body inserted in the dripping sack and carried between them to the gig. One mounted to keep it in its place, and the other, taking the horse by the mouth, groped along by the wall and bush until they reached the wider road by the fisher's tryst. Here was a faint, disused radiancy, which they hailed like daylight. By that they pushed the horse to a good pace and began to rattle along merrily in the direction of the town. They'd both been wetted to the skin during their operations, and now, as the gig jumped among the deep ruts, the thing that stood propped between them fell now upon one and now upon the other. At every repetition of the horrid contact, each instinctively repelled it with greater haste, and the process, natural though it was, began to tell upon the nerves of the companions. Macfarlane made some ill-favoured jest about the farmer's wife, but it came hollowly from his lips and was allowed to drop in silence. Still their unnatural burthen bumped from side to side, and now the head would be laid as if in confidence upon their shoulders, and now 
the drenching sackcloth would flap icily about their faces. A creeping chill began to possess the soul of Fetis. He peered at the bundle, and it somehow seemed larger than at first. All over the countryside, and from every degree of distance, the farm dogs accompanied their passage with tragic ululations, and it grew and grew upon his mind that some unnatural miracle had been achieved, that some nameless change had befallen the dead body, and that it was in fear of their unholy burthen that the dogs were howling. For God's sake, said he, making a great effort to arrive at speech, for God's sake, let's have a light. Seemingly, Macfarlane was affected in the same direction, for though he made no reply, he stopped the horse, passed the reins to his companion, got down, and proceeded to kindle the remaining lamp. When at last the flickering blue flame had been transferred to the wick and began to expand and clarify and shed a wide circle of misty brightness round the gig, it became possible for the two young men to see each other and the thing they had along with them. The rain had moulded the rough sacking to the outlines of the body underneath. The head was distinct from the trunk. The shoulders plainly modelled. Something at once spectral and human riveted their eyes upon the ghastly comrade of their drive. For some time, Macfarlane stood motionless, holding up the lamp. A nameless dread was swathed like a wet sheet about the body and tightened the white skin upon the face of Fetis. A fear that was meaningless, a horror of what could not be, kept mounting to his brain. Another beat of the watch and he had spoken, but his comrade forestalled him. That is not a woman, said Macfarlane in a hushed voice. It was a woman when we put her in, whispered Fetis. Hold that lamp, said the other. I must see. And as Fetis took the lamp, his companion untied the fastenings of the sack and drew down the cover from the head. The light fell very clear upon the dark, well-moulded features and smooth-shaven cheeks of a too familiar countenance, often beheld in dreams of both these young men. A wild yell rang up into the night. Each leaped from his own side into the roadway. The lamp fell, broke, and was extinguished, and the horse, terrified by this unusual commotion, bounded and went off towards Edinburgh at a gallop, bearing along with it, sole occupant of the gig, the body of the dead and long-dissected Grey.